Welcome to New Hope Christian Church. We are so glad that you are here today. What a glorious day. Uh, our auditorium has been painted, or at least started, more than started, yeah. Uh, we had a bunch of people show up to paint yesterday. Thank you so much. They painted the fellowship hall, and then this next Saturday, we're going to paint the hallways and do trim work and all kinds of things. So, so we're very thankful for that, and uh, thank you so much. It makes such a difference. Now today, uh, is we're going to have pictures for our pictorial directory, and uh, boy, you did such a good job last week. We got most pictures taken. There's still a few. Uh, I want to remind you that this is a friendship directory, and it's not a church membership directory or anything like that. It's just a friendship directory, and it helps us to know who you are, connect names and faces. Everybody will get a copy of it. And uh, I hope if you haven't had your picture taken yet, that you'll have your picture taken right after church at, at one of these banners, either this banner or the banner back here. And the only difference in getting it done this week and last week is if you get it done this week, you got clean paint behind you, all right? So that is good, all right? So be sure to get your picture taken if you would uh, today. Now we have a lot of sign-up sheets uh, uh, in the back of the auditorium for paint day. We are going to have a paint day next Saturday. Several have already signed up, but boy, if you haven't signed up, please do. We could really use your help uh, next Saturday starting at 9 a.m., and uh, we'll provide some lunch for you, but that'll be a lot of fun uh, to do that. So be sure to sign up if you haven't done so uh, as of yet. And then our anniversary, uh, the 21st anniversary is coming up on Sunday, March 18th. We're looking forward to that celebration. It's going to be a great celebration, and uh, we want you to be here. We're going to have a fellowship dinner on that day, uh, and we need you to bring items for that fellowship dinner, sign-up sheet in the back for that, and then the golf tournament. We've got a golf tournament uh, scheduled for this year for Saturday, March 24th, 10 a.m. The cost of the golf tournament is $55. And you got to register for this golf tournament now by this Thursday, uh, March 15th. You have to do it by March 15th. So see me after service if you're interested uh, in that golf tournament. Just going to be a lot of fun and hope you'll plan uh, to participate uh, in that. Well, uh, I tell you what, uh, 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 our classic car show, I, I don't know how we could pick two days with worse weather for our classic car show in Florida. You know what I mean? But with all sunshiny days, but uh, today is sort of a gloomy day, and uh, these guys don't like to bring their cars out on gloomy days like this. So I don't know if there are any cars out there or not, or how many are out there. There might only be a few. But hey, look, the good news is we're going to have hot dogs and chips and soda afterwards anyway, all right? So when you leave today, boy, you go out and uh, get yourself a soda and a hot dog and some chips. If there are cars out there, you go out and look at the cars, and, and, and you'll, you, you just have a good time doing that. Now, now listen, the, the, the most important day of the year for Christians is coming up on Sunday, April 1st. Sunday, April 1st is Easter. And boy, there are going to be people going to church all over the place, and you need to invite people to church on Sunday, April 1st. I can't wait for that Resurrection Sunday. Now, you know, it's, it's sort of funny that, uh, uh, you know, Easter is on April 1st. And we got a special video to show you for that, just so you'll remember about Easter. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, hey, uh... <laughs> We, uh, we have some cards in your bulletin for Easter. Give them out to your friends, would you? And invite them for Easter Sunday. They'll be blessed by being here. Well, today is Time Change Sunday, okay? I don't know how your body adjusts to time change Sunday. I suppose that some bodies adjust better than other people. I don't know, but it is certainly a matter of adjustment, isn't it? But it really is a choice, and it's a responsibility that we have to change. You know, the way you live your life is your responsibility. 
I'm going to be talking about a scripture this morning from the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. If you want to turn there, I'm not going to read that passage this morning, but the story that we have this morning comes from that passage, and it points to that very fact that the way you live your life is your responsibility, it's your choice, you make some decisions, and the disciples See, a blind man, a man who was born blind, he had been blind from birth, and they come to Jesus and they ask Jesus this question, whose fault is it that this man is born blind? Who has sinned? Is it his parents or is it his parents' parents? And Jesus turns to his disciples and Jesus said, all this has happened so that God will be glorified. And then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And Jesus turns and he looks at these disciples and he says, listen, you disciples can make a difference in somebody's life. He said, you were brought into the world, circumstances and all to make a difference in somebody's light. And he says, you are the light of the world. And because you are the light of the world, you can be the ones who touch people's lives. I want to tell you about something that happened to me just a few weeks ago. I walked into Pizza Hut. And as soon as I walked into Pizza Hut to pick up our pizza, we had called it in. I noticed that the uh, that the cashier was talking on the telephone, and it became very obvious that she was dealing with one of those very difficult phone calls, a complaint uh, to Pizza Hut. And I listened to her, and she said, I noticed, she said, well, listen, according to our computer, yes, you're correct. Your pizza was delivered a few minutes early. And then she apologized because they had delivered the pizza a few minutes early. She got off the telephone, she looked at me, and she said, this is the first time in my life I've ever gotten a complaint for delivering a pizza early. You know, some people are just like that, aren't they? They complain about anything and everything and everybody. It's always somebody else's fault. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he seems to say to his disciples, no, it's not somebody else's fault. Instead, God wants his glory to shine, whatever the situation. I want to tell you about some wonderful Christian people this morning, Vernon and Mona Newland. Just so happens that Vernon was the founder of St. Louis Christian College, the college where I was president, Vernon got special training in medicine in the medical field because Vernon and his wife wanted so badly to go to the mission field and be a blessing for God. And they knew that they could be a special blessing for God if they knew something about medicine. And so they went to Tibet to be missionaries back in the 1930s. They were there in Tibet and a war broke out and the chief of a local tribe was wounded. They came to Vernon Newland and they said, listen, we understand that you have some medical uh, training and we're wondering if you could help our chief. And he said, absolutely, I can help your chief. And so he went to the chief and he actually removed a few bullets from the chief's body and bandaged him up and ended up saving the chief's life. But a few years later, another war broke out and this time the chief was killed. And all the members of the tribe were furious and they decided that they would go through the area and they would kill every single male. They were about to hang Vernon Newland when one of the members of the tribe looked at him and remembered that was the man who had saved our chief so many years ago. And they decided not to hang him. Instead, they spared his life. Well, right after that, the Newlands decided, we think it's time to have a furlough, okay? And they left the mission field for a period of time, went to the United States for a short period of time. They had three children, Melvin, Marcia, and Neil. Melvin 
when they returned to the mission field to Tibet, that's where they thought they were going, to Tibet, when they returned to the mission field, they left Melvin in the United States to continue his education. They had absolutely no idea that this was going to turn out to be a four-year separation from their son. It was 1941, and by this time, the Nazis and the Japanese had teamed together to win the war. The Newlands didn't make it back to Tibet. Instead, they were stranded in Cebu, Philippines. I don't know if you realize this or not, but for a period of time, all the passports in the United States were canceled during World War II. And so the Newlands passports were canceled and they couldn't leave the Philippines. They had to stay there. And on the very day that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they also attacked the Philippines. The Newlands' life was in danger and they escaped to the mountains and they stayed in the mountains for a short period of time, but then they were captured and they were put in a prisoner of war camp. Mona was pregnant. She gave birth to her son, Paul, in that prisoner of war camp. Uh, they said, you know, in the beginning, it wasn't too difficult. It was just a place to stay and a place to live. They had food and they had, uh, they had shelter. But then it became clear that the Japanese were losing the war. And as it became clear that the Japanese were losing the war, it became tougher and tougher. And finally, the Japanese decided that they were going to lose the war. And they were ready to kill all the men in that prisoner of war camp. There were British and there were Americans in the prisoner of war camp. One of the British men was a spy in that camp and he had devised a communication device to communicate with the American and the British soldiers. And so they did just that. The, the food was scarce. The treatment was cruel by this time. These Japanese had decided to kill all the men in the camp and he, he sent out a message. If you don't get here tonight to save us, we will all be dead. That night, the second squadron of the 8th Cavalry Division of the United States Army descended on the prison camp and the U.S. Army liberated that camp and liberated all of Manila. There was a triumphant atmosphere in that camp on that particular night, but not for Vernon Newland. He walked through the grounds and he noticed a canvas and he raised up that canvas and under the canvas were the bloodied bodies, American soldiers who had died to save his life. He had tears in his eyes and he realized that these men died for me. They returned back to the United States. They were reunited with their son, Melvin. They could have been bitter. They could have said, we've had enough, but they didn't. Ministry was a part of their lives, and they began to plant Bible colleges all over this country to produce more preachers and more missionaries that would go out and make a difference around the world. That son, Melvin, became president of one of those Bible colleges. The son, Paul, that was born in the prisoner of war camp, became the church planter at a church in St. Louis and stayed in St. Louis for 40 years. Their sons and their daughters entered the ministry and made a difference in the kingdom of God. And now today, their grandsons and their granddaughters are entering the ministry, making a difference in the kingdom of God. You see, the way you live your life is your responsibility. And you can be a light in dark places, whatever comes your way. The way you live your life shows your trust in God. 
And in this scripture text, in John the ninth chapter, it tells us that Jesus bent over, he spit on the ground, he rubbed his hand in the sand, and he took what would become a salve of healing. He rubbed it on the man's eyes, and he said, now go to the pool, to the pool of Shalom, and wash your eyes. And the man did just that. He went to that pool, he washed his eyes, and he could see. That word shalom is an interesting word. It means scent. You see, it was a simple journey to go to the pool of shalom, the scent place as a test of faith. And it answers the question, do you really trust me? And if you will really trust me, then God will be glorified. And God sends us to all kinds of places so that we can show our trust to Him. God wants to announce to the world, listen, I am at work in your life. I want you to make a difference with your life. I want you to make a difference in the way you live. I want you to make a difference in the lives of people around you. And you will make a difference if you'll just trust me. Whatever you do, don't be like the person who called into the Pizza Hut to complain because their pizza was too early. See, this was the simplest step of faith. Just go to the pool and wash your eyes. And God brings us through in such a unique way those simple tests of faith and then those bigger tests of faith. And that is the one thing that I love about baptism so much. It is so simple. Simply a matter of saying yes to God. Yes, God. I want to follow you in the simple ways. And I know that when I follow you in the simple ways, God, you will be glorified. I trust you that much. And I know that you're going to work in my life. I'm going to trust you with the simple things. You might ask the question, did this miracle really happen? Listen, you can bet your life that this miracle really happened. The neighbors saw the man born blind they knew that he had been blind from birth but he could now see and the religious leaders those pharisees go to the neighbors and they begin to ask the neighbors questions about this man and the neighbors said we don't know much about this Jesus, all we know is that this man was blind and now he can see. And oh, by the way, you need to know that this Jesus did this miracle on the Sabbath. And when he did the miracle on the Sabbath, he broke the law. Now, folks, let me tell you something. That's like calling the Pizza Hut and complaining because your pizza is too early. I want to remind you this morning that God's timing is always right. It's real hard for us to trust God's timing, isn't it? God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. And the Pharisees looked at these neighbors and said, Listen, that proves it. This Jesus is certainly not the Son of God. We don't know who he is, but he's not the Son of God. And the Pharisees didn't believe that the miracle took place. And so what do they do? They go to the parents of the man born blind and they ask him, Was this man really born blind? And the text of Scripture very carefully explains that the parents didn't want to give any credit to Jesus. That Jesus was the Lord and Jesus was the Messiah because these Pharisees had already stated that if you name Jesus as Lord and as Christ, you'll be kicked out of the synagogue. Folks, listen, that's like being kicked out of church. They didn't want to be kicked out of church. And so the parents 
say to these Pharisees, He's of age. Go ask him. He'll tell you what happened. And so the Pharisees who had already talked to the man go and talk to the man again. They want to dig deeper and they want to make it tougher. And they go to the man and the man says, Listen, I don't know much about this Jesus. But this is the one thing I do know. I once was blind. But now, I can see. I'd like for you to say those words with me, would you? There's such words of faith. I once was blind, but now I can see. And that's exactly what the blind man said to these Pharisees. I once was blind, but now I can see. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of of the living God. There's something very sad, John, the ninth chapter. You see, when the man said that, it should have been the end of the story. That really should be the end of the sermon. That should be the end of chapter 9. But that wasn't the case for these Pharisees. The Pharisees turn on Jesus and they ask him, or they, they, they turn on the man and they ask this question, how did he do it? And the man turns to these Pharisees and he says, listen, what's the problem? He says, do you want to become one of those disciples? And they are furious with that response. They begin to discredit the blind man as a follower of Jesus and state that they are followers of Moses, and they make the statement, Moses is our Savior. I learned something a long time ago. You be cautious of people who use the Word of God to prove a false narrative. I've heard people say, well, it's my race, or it's my circumstances, it's my situation. You, you don't understand. You haven't walked in my shoes, and that's so true. I haven't walked in your shoes, and I've heard people who have said, it's the experience of tragedy in my life, and the, you don't understand the experience of the tragedy in my life, and if you understood then you'd see things differently. And the blind man who could now see simply says, but I know Jesus. And the blind man makes it clear that it is Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Christ. The blind man states, this is very strange. I can't believe what I'm hearing from these religious leaders. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. God hears those people who trust him. He cries out, come to worship me. Follow my way and follow my will. And this man, Jesus, is God. I trust him and I believe. And then the scripture goes on. The way you live your life testifies to the truth that Jesus is indeed Lord. Really only two choices that we have to make. First choice, follow Christ and see as you have never seen before. According to Franklin Graham, when Billy Graham died, he was physically blind. He could not see. But Billy Graham knew the deeper truth this man born blind had discovered. Once I was blind, but now I see. He knew without question about the joys of heaven and he could see heaven as if it really were a reality. And then there's a second chance, choice. 
you can be just like these Pharisees. You can be spiritually blind. You think you have life under control and you understand everything, but above all, people uh, like you are blind to the truth of Jesus Christ and you can't see. Now that's pretty harsh. But that's exactly what Jesus says to these religious leaders. They were spiritually blind and they did not see. There's a passage of scripture that I love in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 20. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. John Newton it's a great Christian. He wrote songs in the 18th century. He wrote a particular song that has influenced people. Imagine this. In the 18th century, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and in the 21st century. He wrote a song. It was first sang on New Year's Day, 1773. The words of that song are about the amazing grace that God offers us. In the words of that song from, come from this scripture text in John the ninth chapter. And I'd like for us to sing that song as we close our service today. Would you stand and would you sing?